Hey, good morning. How's it going, everybody? Thanks so much for joining me today. Let me see. Let me adjust this volume here. Um, thanks again. I appreciate you guys coming in on uh, Friday morning to talk about packaging. Today, we're talking about materials. Um, so if you've ever designed packaging, I know that I have early in my career where I've designed packaging um, you know, on the computer. I've like laid out all the art, everything. And then um, come to find out, I didn't know what... Uh, what materials to choose like that was that was foreign to me at that at that early stage where i was really just focused on the design what's it going to look like um you know i thought about like what it would feel like and what it would sound like but i never really thought about like what materials i'd choose until it was the very end and then what happens is that you your print doesn't look right um production has to change you may have had one manufacturer and now they can't achieve the look that you're going for because that's not the material that they work with um, and you're kind of bound to the materials that they do work with. So today we're going to just talk about materials. Um, you know, how do you even know what materials to choose from? Like, what are the materials that are out there? Um, what kind of questions you can ask to kind of narrow down the options that are out there, right? Is it paperboard, my mycelium, EVA, um, you know, EVA foam, corrugate, plastics, aluminum. There's so many different things out there. Um, you know, biodegradable, compostable, like so many things that, can impact your packaging. So again, today we're just talking about all about materials. Um, if you have any questions, just throw them in the comments here. Uh, I appreciate anybody that has any questions. We've got a lot of people here in this group that can answer questions as well, uh, as well as myself. Great questions. I'll just throw them up on the screen. We can all look at them. We can all answer them together. So if you're ready to get started, let's do this. Um, so just do me a favor, just do uh, hit a quick like or throw a quick comment in um, on LinkedIn. Let me know where you guys are watching from. Last last week, we're, we're spreading out even further. We went uh, Korea, um, Middle East, like we went, we've gone uh, all over the place, which is amazing. So I appreciate everybody coming in from different areas. If you're having a hard time hearing me, let me know that too. Um, but yeah, let's just jump right in. Okay, so let's see. So this week um, has been kind of exciting. Monday is going to be a big day. And the reason is like, as this community continues to grow and we have more and more people showing up here, <laughs> we got New York coming in. Um, as we get more and more people in this, in this group, uh, my network increases, which means that your network does as well. Uh, Marco, I appreciate you're always here. Um, Saraya, Saravia. Um, from Denver. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Sagar. Um, all right. So what we're doing is, um, you know, as we continue to grow this network, I, you know, I ask that you guys connect with each other. Um, I had a brand earlier this week reach out to me and say, Hey, do you know, um, uh, do you know an industrial designer that knows how to use glass that can produce bottles that can, um, design fragrance bottles? Absolutely. I looked through my network. I had, you know, three people that I, I thought were great, spoke to each one of them. Uh, discussed the project with them. They said, yes, I can do this or no, I can't. Connected them. They're kicking off a project on Monday. Um, previous to that, I had a Fortune 500 uh, company reach out and say, do you have a, do you know an industri industrial designer that knows packaging but can also do visual design? I went through my network. I did. Uh, they kick off, uh, they start working on Monday. So again, it's like we build this network together and we can help each other out. So definitely do as you're as you're sharing um, if you have any questions, throw them in here. If you do have a need for hiring or you're looking for work, uh, reach out. I might know somebody. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate seeing everybody kind of hopping in here from Boston to India, Bengaluru, Beng Bengaluru, India. Awesome. Appreciate you guys. All right. So let's get to this class. What are materials, right? So um, what materials are there and what do you start? So there's two, pa there's two paths to choosing the right material for your packaging. One is looking at it from more of an engineering side. And with packaging, you've got engineering, you've got packaging science, you've got packaging design, and you've got manufacturing. There's so many different paths to take. We're going to focus on two. The first part, and the first part is what questions you're asking. And not just what questions you're asking, but why does it matter, right? So let's go through and kind of go down the list of what these questions are. I'm just going to click them through here real quick. Um, you know, what are the materials, you know, uh, you know, PET, 
uh, molded fiber, corrugate, foams, you know, some new innovative materials like this uh, corrugate. Well, I got to figure out which way to point. This one right here, it's a uh, flexi hex. It's uh, sh uh, sheets of paper that are bound and, you know, they can accordion together. Super protective, super awesome. But there's a lot of stuff out there that you might not be aware of and how to find it. So let's kind of go through the list. The first thing is, I got my list out of order here, but we're going to keep going. Um, first question is, what's the product? Right, you got to define what the product is. Is it a liquid? Is it a garment? Is it an org organic uh, compound? Is it frozen peas or frozen corn? Right, like what is the product is really critical. And I know when you're designing packaging, um, you kind of have an idea of what the product is. You might even have the product in hand, but a lot of times, if we're not asking what the product is, um, and we're just you know, and we're just designing packaging, as an example, you start working on a, on a product. If you're a young designer, a freelance designer, um, you're getting a, a company reach out to you, say, hey, we're, we're developing packaging for corn. And you just get going and come to find out you're designing packaging for, uh, you know, chucked corn and it's really for frozen corn, right? There's a lot of differences between just that initial question up front that can lead you to a million different materials, a lot of different things, which is then the second question. Once you've defined that product and you know what it is, which I know is like a simple question, but it's a question that a lot of people miss. Now you can move on to the second one, which is the product needs. And this one's really important, right? As you know what the product is, now what, do the, what does the product need? You can go through and look at competitors. You can see what they're currently doing. Just get an overall sense of what it is. Reach out to customers, find out what, what they need from that product. Um, things that you're going to find out are, you know, what kind of barrier properties do you need? Um, you know, I spoke to Jonathan Azaroff from Dip. You know, he's a packaging designer. He launched a product with his wife. It's a, a shampoo bar. They've got a, a folding carton box, but they have to have a waxed paper on the inside that wraps this individual soap for the barrier properties because the paper board doesn't have the properties necessary to keep the oil from sweating through the box. So again, it's like, what does the product need? Um, does it need to be childproof? Are you looking for preservation, impact protection, presentation, right? And each of these are different. If it's a luxury brand, it really needs presentation. It's all about how that product is presented. Obviously, you're going to need protection. Um, but if it's a garment, you don't need as much protection. Uh, does it need to be childproof? That kind of changes what materials you choose. You can't be using, um, you can't be using just craft paper and sheets of uh, normal here that can be torn easily. You're, you have to then now look at some different plastics and different constructions, um, you know, laminations, things are going to add strength to that paper or even just looking for different paper. So again, those, those things make a huge difference. What else does a product need is, you know, that's also going to be like from a protection standpoint, I know I've worked on some tech packaging in the past where the tech products, um, this isn't like the most high tech remote, but Say, for example, this has a matte finish on here and you've got a gloss, um, you know, you've got a gloss material on here, like an ABS plastic or something. That matte finish can scuff off if you've got um, the wrong material in there. So what does that product need? It needs protection. So when you get your iPhone, you get, you know, typical computer products, there's always a plastic film over it. It's to avoid the scuff. So again, these are things that you've got to think through as you're designing the packaging. And scuff is a huge issue because if, you've, if you're buying a $300 speaker, $300 product, whatever the cost is, you've got an expectation. And if you get it and a portion of the finish is rubbed off because of transit against the paper, you know, just the, the transit vibrations against the paper, even the smoothest paper can act like sandpaper against this product. So it's definitely something that you've got to look at. Um, let's see, we've got some comments in here. We're still coming in. Um, let's see, potential hazards product based on its nature and distributive a hundred percent. It, it goes across the board. You really have to think about every aspect of it. Uh, and I really, you know, I think it's important to think about this before. <laughs> did, did I really do that? You know, I, growing up, um, my mom was a stickler for, um, posture knowing where your, where your silverware went and, um, how you held your cup. 
<laughs> so I can't, I can't control it. Um, I, you know, posture at the table and then if I slouched, you got to wallop across the back to stand, you know, to sit up straight. So it's been definitely dug in and it's not like we were fancy. We were broke and poor, but what mattered to mom was, uh, making sure you presented yourself. Well, <laughs> that cracks me up, Mike. All right. So the next thing, um, these questions right here, these letters, right? H H W. This is my favorite set of questions in any pack. How much, how many, and when this is going to make a huge difference in the materials that you choose. It's going to make a huge difference in what you even design. You got to know your budget, your quantity, and your timeline. So as an example today, you know, working on a project for packaging, um, a client has specified a, a specific paper. They love this paper. Well, two things in this project, that paper is not realistic because one reaching out to the paper mill, they're on holiday. That's a European paper mill and they're on holiday for the next uh, four weeks. So there's no response. The paper that they actually have on, uh, on the shelf is all the paper that they've got. They're going to start production again in six weeks. Not only that, um, their supply chain shortages happen at the moment. At the moment, so there's you know people having issues getting different types of pulp in order to create the paper that they're selling. So a lot of paper mills are reducing the paper that they're offering. So they may have an offering of like fifty different colors and different textures, but now they're only offering ten, like their main ones. So again, knowing how much, how many, and when. When is important because. If we need this packaging done in the next six weeks, it's impossible. It won't happen with that paper. We got to just shift to something else. So any material uh, that they've chosen, anything that from a design standpoint that would um, deliver the look and feel that they're asking for just won't happen, right? We got to find a substitute for that. How much budget is really important because you have to think about the entire program, um, not just what, um, not just your part of it in terms of design, or not just your part of it in terms of manufacturing, the whole thing. Because from the customer's perspective, their budget is their budget. You know, they're going to the they're going to the grocery store with five bucks. They don't care um, that it took that it cost you know ten cents to ship it to ship the milk to the grocery store. They don't care that it cost you know twenty cents to do this. At the end of the day, what well, the money they have is for everything. So same thing with their packaging. They're expecting their budget for design, for manufacturing, for shipping, for warehousing, like everything. Um, usually because they just don't know everything goes into packaging and it's your, it's part of our, our, our duty to help educate those guys. Um, let's see what we got. <laughs> Dude, it was hilarious, man. Uh, I appreciate it, Mike. Um, all right. So then, all right. So now you know what your product is, what it needs, how much, how many, and when, um, now you've got an idea of how much money you're playing with, how much time you've got. So any kind of conversation that you can have at this point in terms of many materials, I know we want to get into all these samples that I've got here to talk about materials, but it's really important to be able to identify these three things before you even get started. So now any conversations that you're going to have with a paper supplier, a manufacturer, you know, fulfillment, you're going to have the answers that they're going to ask because they're going to ask you, what's the product? What do we need? What are we trying to get over? You know, what are the issues like scuffing or protection? they're going to be able to offer you better ideas and help narrow down the field. First part of this is narrowing down the field because there's a million products out there. So again, um, if you're talking to a mill, like I said, I reached out to this mill. They said, Oh, sorry, we can't help you. We're shut down for six weeks. That is like insane to me and alien to me, but that's the way different companies work. Um, so again, going back to the customer saying, this is not even possible. Customer doesn't even understand how that's not possible because you know, we're in the U S you work 24 seven, 365. Um, so hearing that a company shut down for six weeks for a holiday is like mind blowing, but it is what it is. So again, it's like, you have to get those questions. Now, the next part, right? Like, so how does, so like, how does this help in your design? Um, let's say for example, let's say I got, I got a list here. Um, so let's say you're designing a box that you're going to need that needs protection. Um, Oh, like a finger, like I got a list here for like a fingerprint free coating on it. Um, there's a lot of products, tech products that have like fingerprint free coating. That stuff scuffs super easy when it ships. So again, you might have to lay over uh, 
a poly sheet, um, you know, even tissue. We People tend to go to tissue because it's recyclable, but tissue has grit to it and that's going to uh, scuff everything. So it makes a huge difference. So let's move on to the next one here. So the next part of this is the design side of it. So now that you've kind of got this, at least you're asking the questions around the product, around the protection, around the needs and the budget. We're going to, let's talk about the design side of this. So what do you want? Um, what's this paper? What's this material going to communicate? And from a communication standpoint, like visually, from a tactile standpoint, you know, what is this brand trying to say? And paper tells you a lot. Um, is it about sustainability? Do you want to communicate sustainability? Um, are you talking about luxury? Does it need to communicate luxury? Is it tech? Is it fast moving? Um, you know, for example, like texture. Like going back to this uh, slide over here, each one of these materials has a different texture. The clamshell, and it communicates something different too. Like that clamshell is super cheap, right? You get a sandwich at the deli in that clamshell. It's not a big deal. You paid five bucks for a sandwich. You go to the next one down, which is a molded fiber, hot press, super technical from uh, the team over at James Cropper from their color form team. This is like insane engineering that happens um, at this level to deliver this Lancome bot, basically a box that forms to the bottle. Um, that communicates luxury. It communicates craft. It communicates a lot of different things. Um, not only that, but it also stands out on shelf. Then you've got Corgit. Corgit, um, Corgit in and of itself. Can't keep that pinky down. Like um, Corgit in and of itself is, you know, it has that feeling of like Amazon, right? Now you can laminate a beautiful sheet of paper to the top of it, or if you're working with somebody that can customize um, your Corgit. For example, the team over at IDP Direct, who, who does sponsor my podcast, they can corrugate any kind of sheets. So we worked on a project where we where we used um, a cropper paper, as a matter of fact, and it was for the liner, it was for the medium, which is the wavy part, and then the inner liner. So we were able to customize the color, the texture, everything. Um, so that felt super luxury. But if you're getting a brown on brown on brown, that feels like Amazon. It feels inexpensive. <laughs> um. And then you've got like your phones, right? Different types of phones, like the like this like the EPS foam. I've seen somebody do something amazing with EPS foam, even though you don't necessarily want to use it because it's not the most sustainable. If you have to use it, there's one thing that you can do with that material, which is you can create a texture. Um, you can have a texture engraved into the mold so that when this expands inside of that mold, you have this texture on it and it actually breaks up all those little circles. So it doesn't look like a styrofoam cooler. It actually creates like a whole new thing. It looks solid. Um, I've seen some amazing cannabis packaging and uh, molded um, EPS foam, which is, you know, it looks beautiful and it becomes something that's going to, somebody's going to hang on to a little bit longer. Um, so again, going down the list here, what's you, what are you trying to communicate? Next thing is print quality and print quality. I've got some examples here. You know, what, what are you, what are you expecting? Like, what are you trying to print? Um, are you trying to print a yellow? You know, I've got this, uh, Corey Connors from sustainable packaging podcast sent me this thing, you know, a year ago. Um, it shows you white craft and it shows you brown craft. So you, you see the same color on both of these materials and you can see the difference. So again, it's like, if you're trying to achieve this bright yellow, then immediately you know that brown craft is, is out of the question, right? So again, it's like driving what you're doing. Now, if you're trying to achieve a really bright yellow, um, like if you're looking at your Pantone coded book, that's going to determine that you're looking for a coded sheet, which is not going to be a corrugate unless you're laminating that too. So these things make a huge difference. Let me see, we got some questions in here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Corey, uh, you know, I appreciate you sending that this this book to me. This has uh, been a lifesaver in a lot of instances. It's a really easy way to explain to customers the, the way that you know to brands and, and, and agencies the ways that color changes on different papers. Man, I appreciate that. Um, does actual cast of product help dictate cost? Of yes. So that's one of the questions that I have in here. 
which is what does your product retail for? Um, so for example, working um, with with a brand that was doing speakers, uh, like Bluetooth speakers, they were I think they were like $350. That has to feel, when it delivers to the customer, it has to feel like a $300 to $500 product. What that means is you can't use a folding carton Right. You can't use like just a little tuck box to open up this $500 piece. It doesn't feel like it's well protected. Even if it arrives in one piece, it doesn't feel like it's been, um, it's not being respected as a product. And you're kind of expecting this experience. Um, it's all about the ceremony of how you open a box. Um, so that might mean that you're doing rigid board, you know, something like this, where you can get like a nice sharp 90 degree fold on it. Um, it feels heavy. It feels more substantial. Um, you could be doing like a high grade corrugate that's folded over to create the the effect of having a um, rigid box. There's a lot of different things that you can do to achieve a sense of perceived value, right? You want the box, the pack to give the sense of perceived value to the customer uh, for the product they bought. An example, um, again, is like if you went in and bought, um, if you went into Brooks Brothers and bought a suit, I don't know, Brooks Brothers went out of business. If you went into, I don't know, pick a brand and you bought a, a suit or you bought a, a dress and you're like, you should ship it to my house. You go home and then you arrive at your home and there's an Amazon box with your garment in a poly bag just thrown in there. It doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like there's any value to it. They don't value it. You're not going to value it. You need that, ex- you need that expression in order to really make, um, you know, that experience to really make it feel like it was worth your money. And that's kind of part of the packaging. So Mike, great question. Cost plays a huge role in there. Um, you know, print quality again, makes a big difference. What kind of print are you after? You know, are you looking to do, um, you know, are you looking to do neons? I'm going to hide this thing here. Cause this is blocking my face. You know, are you looking to do neons? Um, you know, how's the paper going to absorb that? Not neons don't work necessarily on every type of paper, on every type of surface. Um, are you looking to do like a letter press? Then in that case, you need to do a heavier gauge paper, um, you know, a little bit thicker. Uh, it can be a little less dense. So you get a deeper impression on it. Um, you know, the denser the paper, the harder it is to give, live an, leave an impression. Um, so there's a lot of different things that help you choose those things. If you're looking to do um, print metallics on something, Sometimes some paper may absorb those metallics a little bit more than others. So it really mutes it. So if you're printing like a gold ink, it'll just look like brown, um, like a dirty yellow brown, which is not a cute color. Switching over to cold water here. Um, The other question is just from a, you know, sensorial standpoint, like how does this feel? How does it sound? Um, how does it look? I've got um, some examples I'll show you here. Like this is, all right, so this is my psyllium packaging. This is from the Magical Mushroom Company. Um, they just did the shoe boxes for Adidas and Mr. Bailey with the Black Inks project. This has a specific feel. You know, it's, it's heavy. Um, it's dense, but, you know, it can kind of feel like uh, like your product is packed in a oatmeal cookie. It's just like, you know, or like one of those uh, granola bars, like you open and it's just like crumbs. Um, so definitely something that you have to kind of consider. It's like, how does it feel? How does it break down? Um, not only that, but you can't, uh, with mycelium, you can't nest it. Nesting is really important from a sustainability standpoint, storage standpoint, cost saving standpoint, right? If you've got two boxes that are this big, but if you can nest them, then they can kind of fit inside of each other and you've reduced your overall size by like 90%. You can't do that with mycelium. So that's something you've got to think about too. Like it has a great sustainability story. It can break down in your garden. It can break down anywhere, but look at the overall impact that you're having from a carbon emission standpoint, from shipping, from storing, from production. And you have to make sure that that makes sense for your product and your brand. Um, so quick question here, what do we got? So Marco, Pantone's getting crazy. Let's switch to four colors. They're enough 90% of the packaging. Um, yeah, you know, uh, switching from spot colors to four color process is, you know, it gives you the opportunity to be able to, to have a, a larger range of color. Um, 
not only that, we, we've had, you know, we've discussed the, the issue of Pantone um, leaving Adobe and just leaving the, the basic books there. So if you want to use specific Pantone colors, you might have to pay or uh, have the Pantone app on, on your integrated into your Illustrator, which from everything that I've seen, packaging uh, and design related comments are around the Pantone app is that it, it's terrible. I think it has like a one star review and, and, uh, in the app in the app store. So let me see here. I just hide this thing and then we'll get to some comments and I got some papers here and stuff to show you kind of go through. So packaging cost varies from product to product. There is no such formula exists. I suggest competitor, but you know, uh, Sager, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, I would get a lot of clients that would come in and say, you know, they would say, I've heard that packaging should be 10% of the retail product. That that's not the case, you know, We've got just a few minutes here. Um, but yeah, like they would come, you know, clients would come in and say, yeah, we've got um, our, our product is a hundred bucks. So we think, you know, $10 is, is too much to spend, but we've, we've heard that 10% is what you should be doing. 10% is not what you should be doing. Um, you know, if you've got a hundred dollar product that retails for hundred bucks, you've got, you've got a profit margin in there. You can't take 10% of the overall thing, which is probably 50% of your margin. Um, so there's, there, there is no formula hundred percent. Right. Um, so you do have to kind of look at what's out there, but I think also from a material standpoint, if you're looking at materials, it's important to know what the budget is for the client so that you can pick the right materials. Uh, you know, if you're looking to do different textures, um, so like, I don't know if this, this here, this paper is from Fedragoni. This has a, uh, like a felt, like a felted paper texture. This is going to feel more like, it feels kind of like a cloud. It looks like a cloud. It feels definitely more uh, like there's more heritage there. Um, just like there's more craft in the process. Then, you know, if you've got something that's like this uh, Ida texture that they have, and it's hard to see, I'll share some, some images afterwards, but this is, it, it's almost like a cheese grater. It's like really defined angles in the deboss in that texture. That feels more tech. That feels more um, current. It's definitely more, um, it's a complete contrast to the felted texture. Um, and then you've got like a hammered look. And these hammered looks um, can feel like a more modern version of the felted um, texture. Again, that gives you a good sense of feel. Am I going to hot stamp my logo on here? Am I going to print on here? If I print on here and I have a really aggressive deboss texture on my paper, what's that going to do? If you've got a light gray, it's going to make that light gray a little bit darker because you're casting 50% shadow on that paper with those deboss textures. So again, these are things that you have to think about because they're going to impact your color. They're going to impact your cost. Um, so where do I see the role of compostable materials? Compostable materials, um, it really depends, right? I think it's a great idea, but is it... Um, industrially compostable or is it home compostable? If it's home compostable, is this being widely distributed uh, as a product to people that don't have home composting? Um, you know, I think about growing up in New York, we had a tiny little apartment. There's no room for compost. You know, we barely had room for a trash can. Um, so it didn't matter what it was. It was just, it would just go down the chute and, and that was it. Like there was no room for compost. So if your brand is selling you know, high volumes to these small, you know, tight, pack, tightly packed cities, then composting may not make the most sense unless they've got collection. Oregon, for example, has compost collection, which is amazing, uh, but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily work across the board. Compostable material, if it goes to landfill, landfills get sealed up. There's no oxygen. There's no, um, trans there's no transfer of oxygen. There's no moisture that's happening in there. It's just sealed up. It's not going to break down. And that's a, a hard concept to understand for a lot of brands is that this stuff is not going to, to break down. So I appreciate that question. So in terms of where, what do I see the role? Um, it has to fit the purpose and it has to fit the brand and the location that's being distributed to. Um, but I think the more that we push for it, maybe we can get more collection around this product because it makes the most sense. Um, I happen to have a garden so I can throw that stuff in, into the garden. If it's industrially composted, there's no industrial composter uh, where I live now. So that just goes into the landfill because it doesn't go into the recycle bin. <laughs> All 
All right, so can I suggest an alternative to EPS for cushion other than everything? Um, yeah, there's there's a ton. So one of the things that you can do, it and it depends on the product, right? Are you are you shipping a refrigerator or are you shipping a fragrance bottle, right? Like it, it makes a huge difference. Um, and you're gonna have to work with, you're gonna have to work, you may work at a um, you know manufacturer that can do the appropriate drop testing and checking out your cushion curves and all that good stuff. Or you, or you may not, but if you don't find somebody that can, cause they're going to be able to help you the most. Um, uh, but like, there's a ton of different things. Uh, like this is one insert here that uh, I created with the team over at IDP direct and it, it ships completely flat. It pops up, it holds the product. Uh, it gives you enough cushion. Cause the way that this is built is it, is it has movement to it. So it helps reduce the overall impact, but you know, mycelium is, is a great, is a great solution. Um, you know, corrugate, corrugate can work in a different, in a bunch of different, uh, examples, but, um, mycelium, you've got molded fiber. You can do some really dense molded fiber. Um, doesn't have to be cold. It doesn't have to be, you know, hot press. It can just be regular raw molded fiber, like an egg carton. That's going to give you uh, plenty of cushion, uh, or you can do a combination of things. You can do a beautiful molded fiber tray and then underneath it have layers of corrugate to support it. Um, Apple used to do this a lot where they'd have a beautiful molded fiber tray on top. And then underneath it, if you tore it apart, there'd be little corrugate stands in different areas to per, per help um, add cushion and protection so that that tray wouldn't, wouldn't break. Um, we're kind of wrapping up here pretty soon, but let's see, let's go through these real quick. Color versus material always do farb and cart. I'm going to tell you, I don't even know what that means. I need to do substrate, do a color sample and leave Pantone uh, forever. Um, <laughs> uh, Everybody, uh, I did a post on on Pantone leaving Adobe. Everybody's pushing for lab um, CIE. So I think this is something we're, we're going to talk about because um, a lot of designers don't necessarily know how to uh, select colors in that in that manner. Um, they don't understand. I didn't uh, for a really long time until I was getting on, on, on press and production and seeing how this stuff really made a difference. Um, but yeah, it, it's something I think we definitely need to talk about. Home compost requires high temperatures in ground. Absolutely. Uh, well, I live in, uh, I live in Arizona. So the ground here is like 300 degrees nonstop. Uh, but yeah, there's home composting equipment that you can buy, but it's like a tiny little cooler. And if you're trying to compost all of your packaging, you'll, you're going to run out with your first Amazon order. There's not enough room to, to do that. Biodegradable materials should be preferred over compostable. They don't need a special environment to decompose. Not a not hundred percent true. And I'll tell you why, because biodegradable material in landfill will not biodegrade. Um, so for example, if you've got a, if you rake your yard, you collect all those leaves and that goes to landfill in 10 years, those leaves are still going to be there. There's just not the process in the U S landfills to uh, allow these things to decompose. That's something that, that definitely has to be reviewed, but that's the, that's an issue with that. Last thing here, we got Marco, a uh, protect and produce compostable packaging for fashion products. Every single part of the packaging was compostable, but we failed to obtain industrial compostable certification due to gluing zones. Two parts of cardboard glued together are not compostable. That's an issue. Um, not just that, but there's different types of glues out there, right? So you've got hot melt glues, you've got um, water-based adhesives. A lot of these different things um, can impact the material in, in, in negative ways and positive ways. So there are some materials that when you do a, a water-based adhesive, if it's not treated properly, you can actually um, promote mold growth, right? So you can design beautiful packaging, you can produce it, it can be you know really sustainable. And then when you ship it over the water or you store it in a humid zone, like say Florida or um, Indonesia, or even you know like Spain and Europe this summer, that humidity can get in there, it'll blossom into you know, mold. And by the time that product hits the shelf, you've got mold on your packaging, which means everything has to be destroyed. So again, you have to really be careful of what you're looking at. Um, just a quick, a uh, few couple things I got here. So this is this killer book from, from the team over at Fredragoni. Um, like I said, a ton of stuff from like, this is some folding carton from the team over at Cropper. Uh, we can get into measurements and stuff next week on, on how to measure paper. There is uh, some discussion online in terms of if you measure it by pounds and and weight, or if you measure it by GSM and, um, you know, there's only one way to measure paper. It's GSM, right? 
um, this is a killer book from French from French paper. Uh, you can reach out to them. These guys, none of these guys are sponsoring anything, but these are just really cool. I think it's important as a designer that you reach out to all the mills and get some samples because they are not only telling you like what they have, but they're also showing you what they can do. So they give you great examples, which serve as inspiration. Um, you know, this is amazing. I love this um, letterpress look feel. They've got some goofy things in here that are letterpressed as well. Um, and it gives you a great explanation of how to use their paper. I did see in here from Stefano always has great comments here. Biodegradable is not compostable. <laughs> exactly. This is the one thing that is really important for people to know. Like I said, if I like growing up in New York, if I would get something that was compostable at that point, which back in the seventies and eighties, that didn't even exist unless it was like a banana peel. Um, there's no place for compost. It just, and you can't put it in recycling. It just has to go to landfill. That's compostable, biodegradable. Uh, will break down in the recycling stream. It will damage the, the waste stream. So you actually have to keep that stuff out. Um, so super, super important. That's right. GSM, but life. <laughs> Fedrigoni is good. They're, they all rule. Uh, Marco, Fedrigoni is amazing. Uh, Mohawk's amazing. French paper is amazing. They all have a great, uh, they all serve an amazing purpose. Um, they all have beautiful products that uh, they offer. Um, but definitely. So any questions if you guys have, keep asking them in the comments. Um, if you see a question in here that you'd like to answer, or maybe your company um, or your team can support. And if somebody's asking about compostable materials and you have something you can offer, jump in. Um, it doesn't always have to be answering me answering. I, I love when you guys get in there and, and have a discussion. So I appreciate it. Thank you guys. I hope uh, you guys join me next week. Maybe, you know, let me know in the comments anything that you'd like to talk about. It's always great to have these conversations online um, with everybody. And once again, guys, thanks so much. Have a great weekend. We went a little bit over today, but I'll see you next week.